Fate is defined as the development of events beyond a person's control. And I think you'll see from the people in today's video that no matter how hard you try or how good your decisions are, ultimately, your fate isn't yours to decide. As always, viewer discretion is advised. On April 13th, 2011, in Bowling Green, Kentucky, a woman named Ashley heard a car pull up in front of her driveway and the engine shut off. She looked out the window and noticed that the car belonged to a friend of hers, 33-year-old Kathy Michelle Coy. After noticing that Kathy hadn't gotten out of the car, Ashley opened her front door, walked to Kathy's car, and looked in the window to say hello. When she looked inside, she saw Kathy sitting in the driver's seat and holding a newborn baby boy. Looking closer, Ashley suddenly registered that Kathy was also naked from the waist down with spots of blood all over the seat. Ashley flung the door open to check on Kathy and the newborn baby cradled in Kathy's arms. Then when she took her friend by the arm to help her out of the driver's seat, her shock quickly turned to alarm when she noticed bloody clumps of flesh on the car seat. Not having much medical knowledge, she wasn't quite sure exactly what she was looking at, but it seemed as though the birth hadn't been a smooth one. In fact, it looked to be the exact opposite. From what she could see, they both required immediate medical attention. So shortly after arriving at her home, Ashley drove Kathy to Bowling Green Medical Center and rushed her into an emergency room around 6 p.m. When she got to the hospital though, things would take an extreme turn. It didn't take long for doctors looking after Kathy to become alarmed by her story and the circumstances of her birth. The most alarming part though, was the fact that doctors noticed that Kathy brought in a uterus, ovaries, and a placenta still attached to the baby from the umbilical cord. The obstetrician knew right away that Kathy could not have given birth to this days old newborn she was holding in her arms. Then instead of giving her medical attention like they would a normal birth, the hospital staff called the Kentucky State Police. Three weeks before Kathy was rushed to the hospital, she had befriended two other women who were recommended to her by Facebook. From their pictures, it was obvious the women were pregnant, so Kathy reached out to them to try to get to know them. In one of her initial messages, she said to one of them, how are you, I hear you're gonna be a mom. Then after talking to them further, Kathy found out that one of the pregnant women and her sister were close to being evicted from their home. Kathy then told the woman that she worked for an organization that could assist her in getting baby clothes and financial assistance. Eventually, after talking some more, one of these women agreed to meet up so they could build an in-person friendship. Then, a day or so after the two women met up, the Kentucky State Police received a report of a missing pregnant woman. Only a couple days after that report had been filed, Kathy arrived at the hospital under suspicious circumstances circumstances that indicated that something very bad had happened to someone. Even though Kathy already had two children from two separate relationships, a recent miscarriage triggered something dark to awaken within her. She became obsessed with giving birth and having a child and motherhood and the whole process. Over time, this obsession grew and she started to come up with a sinister plan. This started with her telling anyone who had listened that she was pregnant again after her miscarriage. After a few months of this, she felt enough time had passed to be credible, so she befriended the two women on Facebook with the sole intent of taking one of their babies by any means necessary. Kathy then learned as much as she could about the pregnant women until she zeroed in on the one she viewed as the easiest to get closest to. Her strategy was simple, offer the women life-changing opportunities that a single mother down on her luck couldn't resist. Eventually, Kathy convinced one of these women, a 21-year-old named Jamie Stice, to come with her to buy baby clothes and other supplies for her newborn child. But then instead of driving her to stores to get the supplies, Kathy drove into a wooded area. She then used a stun gun to incapacitate Jamie before tying her up for the final and most brutal part of her plan. She then cut Jamie's wrists and throat and proceeded to open up Jamie's stomach and literally steal her baby from her body. During this horrifying incident, Kathy accidentally pulled Jamie's uterus and ovaries out at the same time as the baby. As terrible as this was, this would at least help doctors and police to catch Kathy for what she had done she had inadvertently brought part of her crime with her after she left Jamie to die in the woods. Kathy was eventually arrested by the Kentucky State Police the same night she arrived at the hospital and charged with first-degree murder and kidnapping of a minor. Initially, in an interrogation, Kathy continued to claim that she gave birth to Jamie's baby. Then after several hours of being grilled by detectives, she changed her story, claiming that she had bought the newborn from her friend Ashley for $550. So immediately, she tried to throw her long-term friend under the bus as well. Once Kathy realized that the investigators weren't going to buy into her claims, she agreed to take them to Jamie's body. It would be one of the most grisly discoveries the police officers would ever see. It turned out that Kathy had killed her in a wooded area off Route 68, approximately 16 miles from the hospital. Over a year and a half later, she was sentenced to life in prison without parole on February 28, 2012, despite Jamie's family wanting the death penalty. 
In March of 1962, a family of five moved into a new home in Mexico City, Mexico. In their family was the man, his five-month pregnant wife, their 10-year-old son, their two-year-old daughter, and their grandmother. When they first moved in, everything was going great and the family was living happily. But then not long after moving in, the 10-year-old boy began to display flu-like symptoms. But these symptoms were much more severe than a typical flu. Initially, none of the adults linked the boy's illness to a metallic capsule he had been playing with for several days. It's unclear where the capsule or the container it was in came from, but it seems to have been inside the home when the family moved in. One thing is for certain though, none of the adults in the home knew that the container and the metallic capsule inside contained certain death for all of them. Even worse, medical professionals at the time knew little to nothing about some of the boy's symptoms and were just as confused as the parents. And because of what happened to each family member one by one, on top of the fact that they had no idea why they were sick, it's unclear who opened the container that the capsule was in and when it was opened in the first place. However, it's thought that it was likely opened by the sun between the end of March and the start of April. When he opened the box and found the shiny capsule inside, he did what any young boy would do and he played with it. And then when not playing with it, he kept it in his pants pocket. The capsule itself was a little shiny metallic cylinder, several millimeters long and several millimeters in diameter. At some point, the boy misplaced the capsule, and then a few days or so later, he found it lying in either the family's front yard or backyard and brought it back inside the home. The mother might have been doing laundry and found the capsule in her son's pants pockets, and for some reason, she decided to store it inside one of the kitchen cabinets where the dishes were kept. After a few days, she noticed that something weird was happening to all the glassware inside the cupboard. All of the glass cups and dishes start to blacken like they were being burned. But as weird as that was, she didn't link her place in the capsule inside the cabinet with them turning black soon after. A few weeks later, in mid-April, the 10-year-old boy started complaining of feeling sick. It started out as a light fever, along with feeling tired and nauseous, and not long after that, those symptoms were accompanied by vomiting and diarrhea. It seemed like he had contracted the flu, but in addition to that, there was a weird burn-like lesion on his thigh, the part of his thigh where his pants pocket was located. With how sick he was, his mom tried to get him to eat, but his appetite was completely gone. At the time, still not linking his illness to this strange capsule, his mom thought that this was just a normal stomach flu or food poisoning. She probably thought that with a little rest and recovery, her son would be up and running again in a few days. But then around this time as well, she and the other family members started to experience similar but less severe symptoms. The boy's mother, like all mothers, probably figured a bug was making its rounds in Mexico City. With her son being in school and constantly bringing home sicknesses at different times of the year, this wasn't an abnormal occurrence. But then after a couple of weeks, the boy's condition didn't get better, it got worse. No matter what the parents did, their son's health continued on a downward spiral. Finally, on April 16th, his parents admitted him to the hospital for treatment, where doctors administered antibiotics, vitamins, topical treatments, and intravenous fluids. Unfortunately, these had no effect, and within a few weeks, the boy's condition worsened to the point that he was hyperventilating, he was having bloody diarrhea, and his temperature was 105 Fahrenheit, or 40 Celsius. Then, tragically and unexpectedly, on April 29th, their son passed away. Along with the obviously devastating loss of their son, the entire family also started to notice their own symptoms worsening. None of them were getting better, and with one child already dead and the entire family becoming gradually worse, panic started to set in. None of the tests doctors ran revealed the source of the illness. That's because it wasn't a virus or disease that was inflicting them. What they had isn't even considered an illness, but rather a syndrome. And the reason the doctors couldn't figure out what the illness was is that the family was suffering from acute radiation poisoning. The shiny capsule the boy had been playing with was a synthetic radioactive isotope of cobalt called cobalt-60, which is artificially produced in nuclear reactors. This is the same radioactive capsule his mother accidentally placed into the cabinet with the drinking glasses, dinner plates, bowls, and other dishes. Despite its small size, the cobalt-60 and the other radioactive source material within the capsule were lethal. How lethal radiation is generally depends on things like the length of exposure, the distance of exposure, and the number of times exposed, and in most cases, particularly during accidents involving nuclear reactors, the amount of absorbed radiation causes victims to die within minutes. Although cobalt-60 is less radioactive than other common radioactive materials, the boy's long-term exposure resulted in him being exposed to a huge amount of radiation over time. Despite how harmless that little capsule seemed, both the exterior of it and the container it was originally stored in were made of lead to prevent anyone from being exposed to that radiation. The exterior layer was not enough to prevent it entirely though. That's why it was stored in an additional container. Because it had been removed without knowing, the entire family's fate had been sealed. Around the time the son was first admitted to the hospital, his mother began suffering from anorexia, nausea, and vomiting. 
Gradually, her condition worsened until she was admitted to the same hospital. Sadly, his mother, along with her unborn child, passed away on July 19th while suffering the same symptoms. The dose of radiation she had received wasn't as much as what her son had received, but it was still enough to be fatal. After her death, the medical staff started to become alarmed. They still didn't know the cause of the illness, and if it was a virus, the National Institute of Public Health of Mexico needed to be notified right away. With two people sick that they were aware of and two deaths, this could have been a potentially serious outbreak. Then, despite the already horrible losses, the situation was still far from over. Even more tragically, four weeks and two days later, on August 18th, the family's two-year-old daughter passed away. Then, the grandmother passed away nearly two months after that on October 15th. The only member of the family who would survive was the father. It's thought that he survived because he left the house daily for work. That time away from home caused him to receive less radiation than the others and ultimately saved his life. It wasn't until later that a thorough search of the home finally discovered the source of the family sickness, but by then, it was already too late. About halfway between the farthest north point of Europe and the North Pole is a series of islands known as Svalbard, located in the Arctic Ocean. And if there was land directly at the North Pole instead of floating ice, it would probably look exactly what Svalbard looks like. Because of how far north it is, the majority of the landmass is covered in ice and there's almost no vegetation. The average daily high in the summer is just 45 Fahrenheit or 7 Celsius, resulting in much of the landmass being covered in glaciers, which is also aided by the fact that the islands are mostly mountainous. So because of how hostile the environment is and how few resources there are, the islands have a population of just 2,500 people, despite being close to the size of Scotland. The bulk of these residents live in just two towns. One is a small coal mining town, and the other houses permanent research facilities for 11 different countries. Again, because of location, it provides researchers with unique access to a natural polar laboratory. Another unique feature of Svalbard is that it's estimated that around 3,000 or a quarter of the world's entire population of polar bears inhabit the islands and the nearby area. This means that there are actually more polar bears in this area than there are people on the islands. These polar bears hunt along the edge of the ice for most of the year, but later all of the adult females build their dens on either Svalbard or another nearby Russian archipelago. Because of this, the likelihood of humans coming into contact with polar bears in Svalbard is higher than almost anywhere on Earth, especially in less populated areas. For this reason, the Norwegian government has included requirements in its camping regulations requiring campers to have several different ways of frightening and chasing off polar bears. For example, campers have to have flare guns and flare pens equipped with thunder flashes, signal cartridges, or sirens. Not only that, but the flares should be stored in such a way that they're readily accessible. For anyone wanting to camp in more desolate areas, the Norwegian government requires even more drastic measures that include a polar bear watch routine, guard dogs, or tripwires. This might seem like overkill, but these measures are totally necessary because polar bears are some of the most aggressive, curious, and dangerous species of bear. Thankfully though, due to how uninhabited the environments are that polar bears live in, attacks are still exceedingly rare. In fact, between 1870 and 2014, there have only been 73 documented attacks, with just 20 of those being fatal. So, despite the obviously harsh environment and dangers posed by polar bears, explorers still come to the islands for an adventure that you can't get almost anywhere else on Earth. Starting in the 1930s, the British School Exploring Society was authorized to bring students to the area to give them a sense of that adventure and teach them an appreciation for the Arctic wilderness. Unfortunately, in August of 2011, 81 years since the expeditions had started, one of them would end tragically. Leading up to this incident, the leaders of the expedition always assured parents that there were a series of safety measures in place, but it seems like some of these safety measures were either ignored, altered, or not adequate. And this was unfortunate because the expedition had a more or less spotless reputation. There really was no reason not to trust the organizers and their precautions. For example, one of the expedition leaders brought along a rifle that fired ammunition thought to be sufficient to deter a polar bear attack, if not outright kill it. And while the rifle was 80 years old, it was assumed to be in good enough shape to serve its purpose. In addition to that, since the group wasn't camping outside of land use planning areas, they weren't required to establish a polar bear watch at night. Instead, the expedition built a literal electrified fence around the campsite to prevent polar bears from entering while they slept in their tents. Then, to ensure none of the explorers accidentally shocked themselves, the electric fence was put up each night and taken down each morning. Crucially, this electric fence was designed to be set up in the shape of a square. Brass fittings were supposedly included in the kit with the purpose of attaching the wire to the fence posts. But as the group set up the fence the first time, they discovered that they didn't have enough brass fittings to set up a square shape. The leaders of the expedition instructed the boys to set up a triangle shaped perimeter fence instead. Then, instead of using the designated brass fittings, the students used paper clips to secure the wire to the posts. 
The expedition also brought the necessary flares along with a signaling device, but then for some reason, the expedition leadership didn't teach all of the members of the expedition how to use them. This series of missteps would ultimately end in disaster. On the 4th of August, one of the students, 18-year-old Horatio, found a set of adult polar bear paw prints right near the camp's boundary. Not realizing the danger this posed, rather than being anxious about finding these prints, the students were excited and took a bunch of pictures of the prints. As far as they were concerned, they had a bunch of safety measures in place. The leaders of the expedition, on the other hand, though, realized the danger and discussed setting up a bear watch overnight. Then, after talking about it, the trip leaders worried more about freaking the students out and having them stand out in the cold overnight. One of the expedition leads even recalled how he had fallen asleep during a bear watch when he was just a student, further supporting the decision not to have the students stand watch. So in the end, that night, the entire camp hit their tents, anticipating a good night's rest. The students trusted the adults and snuggled up into their sleeping bags. Just like the day before, as they waited to fall asleep, they were probably excited about the next day's adventures. As I'm sure you're expecting by now, the following morning at about 7.30, the polar bear returned and snuck into their camp. As it approached, it knocked down one of the paperclip secured posts and the electric current either had little to no effect or the bear simply didn't care. It's possible that the way it was built is the reason it had no effect. As it walked through the quiet campground, it eventually made its way to the tent of Scott, Patrick, and Horatio. The three boys awoke to their tent shaking violently. In their inexperience and likely still trying to shake their grogginess, Scott initially assumed that one of the expedition leaders was shaking their tent to wake them. Within seconds though, he realized that it wasn't one of the group leaders, it was something much bigger. As he sat up, the polar bear pressed down on the top of the tent, causing it to bow inward. The huge animal's five sharp claws sliced through the tent like nothing. By then, the other two students had woken up and saw what was happening. Immediately, they realized that they needed to get out of the tent, but before they could do anything, the bear swiped at Scott's head and back. Its nearly four inch claws sliced into his skin even more easily than they did the cloth of the tent and each time it swiped at him, it left large gashes in his flesh. As painful and as terrible as that sounds though, Scott was one of the lucky ones. During the attack on Scott, Patrick either sat up or tried to move out of the way, but this attracted the bear's attention, and then the bear started viciously attacking him. He curled into the fetal position, but because of how powerful a polar bear is, with just a few strikes, it actually fractured his skull. Horatio, meanwhile, tried to make his way towards the tent's entrance and nearly escaped, but just before he was out the door, the bear turned toward him and pounced on him. Scott and Patrick suffered critical, possibly life-threatening injuries just from being swatted by the bear's paws, but Horatio's fate was sealed once it started thrashing his body around. The polar bear transitioned between slamming him against the rocks and pressing its full weight on top of him, and once he'd gone limp, the bear started chewing on his neck. Horrifyingly, polar bears have one of the strongest bite forces of any land animal. Even worse, polar bear attacks tend to get worse as they continue. In combination with immense biting pressure and incisors nearly half as long as its claws, the animal pulled and twisted Horatio's neck in all sorts of horrible positions. Soon after that, it started in on his face and head. In a matter of seconds, it had fractured and crushed multiple bones in his torso and his head, and its claws and teeth sliced and ripped off significant portions of his flesh. If by some miracle he had survived, he would have suffered permanent, debilitating injuries along with brain damage. The attack eventually came to an end after the polar bear crushed Horatio's skull. As this was happening, Patrick quickly returned to whatever was left of the tent and concealed himself under some blankets. During this as well, other students were awoken by the growling sounds of the bear, along with Horatio's blood-curdling screams. Terrified by the sound of their fellow student being eaten alive, they carefully peeked their heads out of their tents. In that short time, the polar bear abandoned Horatio's lifeless body and started chasing around another group member. All that the students could hear was the heaviness of the bear's strides and the loud crunching of snow under its paws. Finally, the expedition lead readied his rifle, aimed it at the bear, and pulled the trigger, but it didn't fire. The students then watched as the leader pulled the bolt back of the rifle and ejected the malfunctioning cartridge. After repeating this several more times, the bear seemed to notice him and started walking towards him. It then smacked him to the ground and immediately started chewing on his head. Despite this enormous pressure on his skull, he reached up and tried to gouge the bear's eyes out. Unfortunately, either because of the attack or because of the polar bear's special third eyelid, it didn't have any effect on the bear. Just then, another of the leaders risked his life by running up to the bear and yelling at it. He threw rocks at the bear's head, provoking it to chase him around the campsite, but once it caught up to him, it swatted him with its paw and slammed him to the ground as well. The bear then placed a paw on each of the leader's shoulders, leaned its head down until it nearly touched his face, and then stared him down. After a few seconds of this, the bear slashed his face open with his claws and tried to chew on his head as well. At some point during this, the other leader, despite his injuries, managed to get up and reload the rifle. Using one of the cartridges that misfired earlier, he reloaded, placed the bear in the rifle sights, and pulled the trigger. 
This time, the weapon fired and the polar bear was killed almost instantly, finally putting an end to the rampage. Later, a necropsy on the bear revealed that it was approximately 24 years old, which is close to the upper end of what a polar bear can live in the wild. This meant that it was close to the end of its life. Along with being older, it was also emaciated and severely malnourished, its teeth were rotten, and its jaw was very infected. It's thought that the reason it attacked was because of how hungry it was at the time. Tragically, within just those few minutes, Horatio died due to massive injuries to the face, head, and neck. The leader suffered similar but survivable injuries to his neck and upper back. Scott suffered deep lacerations to his face and upper body, while Patrick suffered a fractured skull. The leader who managed to divert the bear's attention also suffered a fractured skull. A formal inquiry was convened, and the parents of the victims tried to hold the expedition liable, but eventually they were cleared of any wrongdoing. Hello everyone, and welcome to Scary Interesting. If you have a story suggestion, feel free to submit that to the email found in the description, or to the Scary Interesting subreddit. Thank you again for watching, and hopefully I will see you in the next one.